We're reading in Habakkuk, chapter 1, starting in verse 13. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked, wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all, the, all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Ever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits uh, its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It, sh it will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. The righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. So uh, let's see. There we go. You're testing. Good. Uh, it seems that Ben and I have all of the wardrobe options covered. If you're a person who likes change, well, then you can look for his different sweater every week. If you're a person who likes things that stay the same, <laughs> I got the, that base covered. So uh, we're, we're, we're good to go on both fronts. We are in our second week in Habakkuk. And uh, looking to this book to give us some direction and clarity and wisdom and hope in these days. It's not an easy book, and really it uh, has to be taken as a whole. I hope you had an opportunity, maybe some of you, to read the whole book through this week. I challenge you to read all three chapters every day for eight days to get the big picture, because really it's, it's one picture from beginning to end. And I'm breaking it down into principles uh, from beginning to end. So here, if you're looking at your outline there in your bulletin or on uh, the U version this morning, we make use of the U version app. You see, we're starting with point four. That's not a mistake. And we'll continue on that way for the next couple of weeks. So let's pray and we'll come back to this helpful book together. Father, thank you for this prophet and for his wrestling. Yes wrestling with God, like Jacob, wrestling all night with you. He is wrestling with issues that are uh, overwhelming to him, dismaying to him, confounding to him. And he's looking for answers, Lord, and he's trying to reconcile who you are with the world in which he lives. And that's what we're trying to do right now, reconcile who you are with this world in which we live. And so, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to believe and embrace. A heart of faith as you fan the flames of faith today through this prophet that we might go forth from this place or from this service as believing people confident in you, resting in you, waiting upon you, strong in you in every challenge that we're facing in these days. So speak now, Lord. We're watching, we're waiting, we're hoping, we're trusting, and uh, we come to you now 
looking for answers. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in your bulletin or in your outline there, you see I started with a little review. And those are, are actually points one to three, which are the three points that we covered last week. Habakkuk is facing a situation that is dismaying to him. He is a prophet in Judah, the southern kingdom, the southern two tribes in the 600s B.C. And the king is evil and the people are wicked and pursuing idolatry and wickedness and injustice is rampant and he is dismayed. And so he's wondering, where is God in all that I'm seeing in my day? And maybe you're asking that question today. Where is God in, in all that I'm seeing in this world today? Whether it's political concerns or social concerns or COVID concerns or economic concerns or your own personal health or troubles or trials. Where is God in this mess? That's what... Habakkuk is asking, and that was our first point, very simply, in your distress, cry out to God honestly, finding your hope in him alone. He looked to God in the trouble, lifted his heart, his mind, his eyes to God, and cried out to God honestly. It's okay to say things like he said last week, why, Lord, how long, Lord, will this go on? And we see that throughout the scriptures, we see the prophets, we see the psalmists, we see others like David crying out in this way, it is okay to ask God hard questions. But the second thing we saw there in the review is when you cry out to God, anticipate answers you won't be expecting. Because God's answer is, I do see I recognize the evil and injustice in your day. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise up the ruthless, evil Babylonians and have them sweep across Judah, pillage and rape and destroy. Well, that was not the answer that Habakkuk was expecting. And God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And sometimes he works in ways that are... Uh, surprising and confounding. And when that happens and you don't understand, what do you do? Thirdly, you affirm what you know to be true. And that's where we ended last week. And we have these wonderful God realities there in verse 12. Are you not from everlasting? God sees from the beginning to the end. Are you not holy? Are you not faithful? We shall not die because you're the God of promise. You've pledged yourself to us. Are you not sovereign? You have ordained them as judgment. You've established them for reproof. Are you not, God, our rock of stability in this unstable world? And so that's where we left it last week. Just resting and trusting in these realities that we know to be true. And I don't know about you, but I keep going back to Romans 8, 35 to 39 in these days. Uh, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or COVID or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things... We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any, anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is true today. It was true yesterday. It's true tomorrow. And it is always true. And so we just rest in that which we know. And that's the foundation upon which we stand as we look to God for answers. So those are the three points we looked at last week. And then there are additional steps here now as we're wandering in the dark. And we, fourthly, we appeal according to knowledge. And so what does he know? Verse 13, you are 
pure, your eyes are too pure to see evil. You cannot look at wrong. You certainly, God, cannot approve of what the Babylonians are going to do. This can't be right and just in your sight. God, who is light and in whom there's no darkness, you can't possibly smile approvingly on the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, and their deeds. And so he's, he turns to this perplexing situation, and again he asks, verse 13, why? God, why are you using these instruments as your instruments of judgment who will overrun your own people? How can this be? Yes, your people, there's injustice and sin to be sure, but the Chaldeans are worse. They're ruthless. Why would you send them to punish your people? And so he's reasoning from the nature of God, you are a holy God. And then it states in his experience what seems contrary to the nature of God. And he describes the Babylonians here as they will become sweeping across Judah as fishermen catching all of God's people in a net. And they will be swallowed up like the fish of the sea brings them up with a hook. He drags them out with a net. And the Babylonians are going to sweep through and catch up God's people in this dragnet. And they worship their idolaters. They will worship the net because it brings them luxury and richness. Killing the nations. Will it go on forever, Lord? How long? So he takes what he knows to be true of God, his holiness, and he raises up the situation before God as he knows who God is. And you can do that in your circumstance. Father, this abuse must be abominable in your sight. Why do you allow it? Lord, you're the God of justice and righteousness, the defender of widows and orphans in their distress. How can you look on this injustice and not overturn it? Lord, the marriage bond is sacred in your sight. A, a lifelong pledge. Why was my spouse unfaithful or why did they leave me? Father, you wish for my child to walk in purity and truth. Why are they so lost? Or Lord, if you love us with an everlasting love, why have our lives been so uprooted by this virus. And so you, you raise up your situation in light of who God is, and he does it, you can do it. It's right to be honest before God in this way and ask him why and how long based upon who God is. And then you watch for God's answer. You watch for God's perspective. And so that's what he says he's going to do beginning at chapter 2, verse 1 here, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me. And the next phrase is a little confusing here. Uh, I take it, not it, there's some question as the translation, and I will see how he will rebuke me, I think is how I'll take it, because I know that there's something I'm not seeing, something not quite right in my perspective, Lord. I know there's going to be some correction to that in this. I'm open to that, and I'm watching and waiting to see what you will say. And so he's casting his burden on the Lord here, trying to get God's perspective on his situation. Because we see, you know, like trying to watch a ball game through a knot hole, and you see, you know, this, this much of what's going on, and God sees the whole picture, and we're trying to get God's perspective, the big picture perspective. So to climb to the tower, it's, 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 he's using an image of the actual watchtower in a city where they rise up above so they can see more broadly the landscape what enemies might be coming, what's happening. And so he's rising up to this place where he can see more broadly, hopefully, as God shows him what he's doing, and God answers him. And so we've got to get into the tower and get up above the circumstances, get our mind's eye off of what's going on, raise up looking to God and watching and waiting for it, to see from his perspective and what God will say. That's what he's doing here. 
question is, how do, you, how do you get up in this tower? What is this tower to which we ascend? And Calvin is very helpful to me here in his commentary. He says, the tower is the recess of the mind from which we withdraw ourselves from the world, rising above our difficulties to gain a right perspective. And uh, here's how Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it in his little book, on Habakkuk. Once we've taken a problem to God, we should cease to concern ourselves with it. We turn our backs upon it and center our gaze on God. But what frequently happens is this. We get on our knees. We tell God about the thing that is worrying us. We tell him that we cannot solve this difficulty ourselves, that we cannot understand, and we ask him to deal with it and show us his way. And then we get up from our knees and we begin to immediately worry about the problem again. Now, if you do that, you might just as well not have prayed. If you take your problem to God, leave it with God, resolutely refuse to think about it or talk about it, and then take our stand looking to God and not at the problem. He's been in my head, because <laughs> that's what I do. I'll take it to God, get, uh, get on my knees, pray to God, and then get up and keep worrying just, to, just like I was on the other side of my prayer. Why do I do that? No. You, it's this casting upon God, it's looking to God, it's resting in God and taking our mind's eye off of the issue and setting it on God. That's what Habakkuk's doing here as he goes to the tower. And, and everything in our society works against this because you're, get, you're reading all these Facebook posts, you're watching the evening news, you're, you're reading different articles, you're listening to podcasts, commentary, opinions, videos. I mean, you're just bombarded with all this COVID information. It's overwhelming and confounding and confusing. And so our focus gets to be on that rather than on God as we look to Him. I mean, we all know the, I mean, you know, wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, Maintain physical distance. Isolate if you're, if you're at risk or been exposed. Wear a mask, and and then look to God. I mean, that's it's it's pretty simple in one sense. What our role is and what God's role is in this day, we ascend to the tower of the mind. Okay, well, how do we do that? Well, Calvin says we climb to the tower on the ladder of the word of God. We ascend on the rungs of truth. I like that picture. It's helpful to me. We climb above our current circumstances. We rise above the problem as we climb the ladder of the word of God, ascending on the rungs of truth. I can, I can picture that in a way. And, and I've done that in different crises or times in my life. Great crisis years ago. I'm in this deepest pit I've ever been in. I, I, I look up and I see nothing but blackness and despair of criticism and opposition and slander and failure. And I'm in this slew of despond and I'm groping around trying to f find some way out. And you, what do you do? You, you grab the first rung. Now for me in this particular crisis, it was a scripture that a friend gave to me that I had really not considered before that seemed like a really strange scripture. And maybe it's not helpful to you at all today. You find your own first rung. It was Ecclesiastes 7.13, what the Lord has made crooked, who can straighten? What? I mean, in my predicament in that particular time, it was get your mind off of the problem, quit trying to figure it out, work it out, leave it to God, you can't make straight. I mean, how do I? Uh, this thing's crooked. Uh, uh, you, uh, uh, I'm going to straight. It's not my job. I can't make straight what God made crooked. I just look to God. And it was it, somehow that's okay. That's the first rung. Okay, how do I respond? All right. Uh, 2 Timothy 2 The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, so that God may grant them repentance, leading to knowledge of the truth. I can't change them. I'm just responsible for me. Okay, second rung. You see how this works? And so you're, you're finding your way out and above and up by. Climbing the rungs of truth. Now, in your particular situation today, it might be entirely different. 
rungs, different scriptures that, tr- that God's Spirit will hopefully impress upon your heart, but it's the same pattern. It's the same manner. You, you climb the ladder of the Word, rising above your troubles, diligently searching for God's perspective. There is no other ladder. <laughs> There's no other ladder. This is the way up. This is the way out. And that's why we're in Habakkuk itself, hoping he's going to give us a ladder here that we may find a way above. When you're submerged, you're shut in, you get above, you go to the tower, you climb by the rungs of the ladder of the Word of God. And then you wait for God to act. And so he's waiting for God to answer, and God is so gracious, and God will answer you, Call to me and I will answer you, he says, Jeremiah 33, 3. And that's immediately what he says in verse 2. And the Lord answered me. The answer comes in two parts. And we're going to look at the part in how God will deal with the Babylonians or the Chaldeans next week. But I want to begin with his instructions to Habakkuk and instructions to us. He says, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. Again, commentators, what what is this all about? And what's this running? Well, uh, you look further. For the still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. Well, waiting and running seem like two very opposite things, don't they? What's the relationship between wait and run? Well, if I let you think, ponder that just for 30 seconds, I bet somebody would come up with the answer. And it is Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint. Now, I, I have to acknowledge most of the commentators don't go where I just went. <laughs> but I think absolutely. Uh, how do you run? Well, you run after you wait. You wait upon the Lord. The Lord renews your strength, and then you will run again. And it's a promise here, and it's a word of hope that we will again run as God gives us wings to soar, fly, run But it is now a time for waiting. He says, wait for it. Wait. Waiting is a a state of spiritual peace and rest in God. It is quieting our hearts before him, resting in his word, expecting an answer. It, it, It is confidence in the adequacy and sufficiency of the Lord as we place our hope in him. Here's uh, how Isaiah puts it in Isaiah 30. In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and trust shall be your strength. For the Lord is a God of justice. And that's the issue in Habakkuk's day, injustice. Blessed are those who wait for him. So uh, I put resting, returning to the Lord, resting in him, quietness in him, trusting in him. This is what it means to wait. And it is a path of blessing. In returning and rest, you shall be delivered. God will act in powerful and dramatic ways on behalf of those who rest in him and wait for him. Because he will act in the appointed time. Look at verse 3. For still the vision awaits... It's appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. God's answer is certain to come and be revealed in God's time. Nothing can frustrate or prevent the answer to our prayers, but it's God's timing for the fulfillment, and it's fixed. Though it seems to delay from a human perspective, how long, Lord? 
It does not delay from a heavenly perspective when you go to the tower and you get the big picture of God's work from beginning to end and you tie your current circumstance to God's big, grand, glorious redemption plan from eternity to eternity. You can see it and it makes sense and it's perfect timing in God's timing, even if it looks not so perfect and looks slow and delayed and you can't understand it in our time. I mean, imagine Noah. God says, build an ark and preach to the people so that they may be rescued and may join you in the ark and be saved. And Noah's, Noah preached to a stubborn, rebellious nation for 120 years and did not have one convert outside his own family. Wow. <laughs> Uh, that would seem slow, wouldn't it? Year after year after year, 120 years. Sometimes I feel like things go slow in the church. Now, compared to Noah, man, we are just like, you know, light rail kind of things steaming along. 120 years waiting in faith, and then it rained. Sometimes we're waiting like Noah was waiting, or when Abraham and Sarah were promised a child, and they're waiting. So there's, a, there's an immediate application to waiting in our current circumstance and situation. But of course, there's a secondary application here that becomes more clear in the New Testament when we're waiting for the second coming of Christ and for justice to come finally and ultimately and all things to be reconciled and all things to be resolved and all violence to end and everything to be at peace. And so this, this verse is quoted in Hebrews chapter 10. Yet a little while and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This is a picture now of us waiting for the return of our Lord when the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he reigns forever and ever. The perfect, glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And so we persevere in the present, awaiting this glorious future day. And until then, next, we live by faith. And that's, you saw it in uh, Hebrews 10. My righteous one shall live by faith. Of course, he's quoting right here, verse 4. The righteous shall live by faith. It's three little words. It's the whole gospel, really, in three words. Righteous live faith in Hebrew. A three-word gospel as we live before God, righteous in Christ, waiting for his return and waiting for him to work in our day. And he gives us a little picture of faith here, really by its dramatic opposite. Because look at the first half of the verse. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. Or verse 5, wine is a traitor. The arrogant man is never at rest. What is waiting? It's resting in the Lord. It's trusting in the Lord. What's the opposite? It's taking matters into your own hands. It's control. It's power. It's dominance. It's arrogance. And he becomes bloated here. Like death, he's never enough and gathers for himself all the nations, collects all the peoples, greed as wide as the grave. He's like a bragging drunk, exaggerating his own exploits. Never satisfied. It is pride that is the opposite of faith. Psalm, 120, Psalm 20, verse 7, some boast in horses, some boast in chariots. That's pride which is the opposite of faith. But we, whoops, uh, we will trust in the Lord our God. Those are your two options really today, aren't they? 
We trust in our own devices. We trust in ourselves. We calculate. We're shrewd. We exercise power. We look to position or wealth or popularity or education or worldly wisdom or something else. Or we boast in the Lord our God. And we have a lovely picture of that in Romans chapter 4. And I really just want to close with Abraham in Romans 4. I encourage you to turn to Romans chapter 4 and just look at Abraham with me because this is all our salvation and this is all our sanctification, really. And it's on display here in Romans 4. You see in Romans chapter 4, he's talking about Abraham. He's just talked about justification and salvation in chapter 3 from our sins. And then he looks to Abraham. Verse 2, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. Pride, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. The righteous live by faith. And so salvation is ours as we trust not in our own works, but we trust in the finished work of Christ by faith. This is our salvation. Then look down to verse 13. The promise to Abraham and his seed would be the heir of the world. And uh, so he's looking for this promise to be fulfilled. Verse 16, this is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his seed. He says, verse 17, I've made you the father of many nations. So God has given this promise to Abraham. So verse 18, in hope he believed against hope. You remember the story, right? When God said, you're going to have a child, and Sarah laughs. (laughs) Yeah, oh, funny, funny. Uh, We're way past that point in our life, God. You surely you understand, you know, who you're talking to here. Impossible can't happen. God says, yes, it's going to happen. But then year after year still goes on. It doesn't happen. In hope, he believed against hope that he should be the father of many nations as he had been told. So shall your seed be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That is why faith was counted to him as righteousness. So the question is, in what way is faith going to be counted to you as righteousness today? In what way is God saying to you, I want you to hope against hope? Yes, it seems impossible. It seems like nothing's happening. It seems all things are contrary. It seems like this is never going to be resolved. It seems like this situation is overwhelming. In what way is God saying to you, I want to count this to you as righteousness, as in this circumstance, you believe. You wait for me, you trust in me, you rest in me, and you just climb the rungs of that ladder of the word by faith, and you put all your hope in me. In what way is God saying to you today, hope against hope, believe in me? Is there a way that God's working in your life today to increase faith in this present day? as he calls you to hope in him in the face of the impossible, that's the call. Either your life is lived by faith today or it's not. There's no middle ground. You can't govern your life by your own opinions, deductions, observations, and draw from the wisdom of the world and then claim to live by faith. What's the controlling principle of your life today? Does this word have absolute sway over your soul? Are you willing to stake everything on the word of God? We just sang Job, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Though all appearances are to the contrary, my hope is in God 
and God alone. Let's just bow in a moment of silent prayer and you express your hope and trust to God in your circumstance today and then I'll close. Father, for those watching here on YouTube or those who are here present in this room, I, I certainly don't begin to know or comprehend all of the issues that they're facing today, all of the crises, the impossibilities, the, the pains, the overwhelming circumstances, the fears and the doubts that may be theirs today. I know my own. And I pray you'd give us all the ability to rest in you, to wait upon you, to trust in our sweetly sovereign God, who in his perfect time is working something glorious today and is going to bring about perfect glory on that great last day. And that we can trust you, that you are on the throne that you are our rock, that you are holy, that you are faithful, that you are just, that you love us with an everlasting love. You can be trusted. Help us to climb the rungs of the ladder of faith today, to climb the tower as you've given us the sweet and precious promises in your word and let them by your spirit be impressed upon our heart and increase faith through them and grant us the gift of peace in the midst of our day and our crisis and our trouble and our fear as we cast ourselves on you in hope and hope in no one or anything but you. We will live by faith. Let it be so of this people this week. To your glory in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.